mid chat. Very pleased to introduce uh, again Lala Wu to the stage um, and Anat Shankar Osorio, who is um, our fireside chat guest. <laughs> Um, she is the host of the Words to Win by podcast and the founder and principal of ASO Communications. And for those of you who joined our um, virtual summit a couple of years ago, she was our keynote then as well. I learned a lot. I know that you learned a lot. It was She was an immense crowd favorite. So we're extremely excited to welcome her back. And I will grab mics for both of you. You have mics. Can we Take turn away. this light off? Then? And we will <laughs> stop blinding you. Yes, <laughs> blinding. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction, Liz, and welcome back, everyone. You are really in for a treat. Uh, for our keynote fireside chat, we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite subject, which is messaging. We all know that words matter. So the question we're trying to answer today is how do we choose the right words to organize, to fundraise, to mobilize, to win? not just for this cycle, but for the long term. There's no better person to be talking with us about this than Anat Shanker Osorio. I have a lot of wonderful things to say about her, but what you should all know is that she is a true messaging genius and deservedly beloved by the progressive community for being both strategic and authentic and making it look easy and as you can see, stylish. <laughs> She's read, she has led research for new messaging on issues ranging from clean energy to immigrant rights to reforming criminal justice. And her original approach through priming experiments, task-based testing, and online dial surveys has led to pro progressive electoral and policy victories across the globe. Her writing and research is profiled in the New York Times, the Atlantic, the Boston Globe, Salon, the list goes on. She lives right here in Oakland, California, and has an extremely busy day today that includes seeing her, her kid in the opening weekend of a play. Very exciting. So she has graciously offered to spend a little bit of time with us here to talk about messaging. So would love to just jump right in. And not two years ago, you joined us at our first that was, I think, our first summit online. Um, and you talked to us about what was the first principle of effective messaging that enabled us to win in 2020. And that was that we need to say what we're for and not just what we're against. I still remember you said that if progressives were to write the story of David, it would end up being a biography of Goliath. So, so is... Is this still the most important principle? Uh, is or and if so, can you give some examples, perhaps from the midterms, or if not, what's changed? Yeah. Okay. Let's start easy. Um. Hi. It's nice to be with you in person. In in my hometown venue. Um. Yeah. I'm gonna say more about my child's play by the end of this just as a fair warning, uh, but I'm gonna answer your question. So basically I would say that my summary statement on this, if we're gonna start sort of at the highest level is that if you want people to come to your cause, you need to be attractive. And oftentimes we are extraordinarily unattractive to other people. <laughs> And a big part of the reason for that, to be fair, is that we are very attracted ourselves as activists to the boy, have I got a problem for you message. We never met a problem we didn't love. And so when people are like, oh, there's this new shitty thing happening, we're like, fantastic. Can I please spend all day indoors talking about that thing? Um, but for most people, for most people who ideologically agree with us, if we ask them questions about different policy priorities, they would be either across the board or at least somewhat progressive. They got 99 problems and they're not out shopping for new ones. And so if we're not enticing them in with something, then they're just going to go about their day. 
because our bigger opposition is not the opposition. It's actually cynicism. It's not that people don't think our ideas are right. It's that they don't think our ideas are possible. So why would I even try? I've got a lot going on. So I would say it's still a permutation of say what you're for, but the rest of the notion of attracting people, the notion of magnetism is that if you're magnetic, you have a polarity, which means that you will attract people, but you will repel others. And if you are repelling no one, then what are you doing? If you want to touch a nerve, then you're going to have to touch a nerve. Otherwise, you're just spouting bland milk toast and no one's going to hear you and no one is actually going to engage and be moved. So yes, it's say what you're for, but it is also draw a contrast with your opposition. And those things are equally important. And I'm, you know, I assume we're going to get into how that played out in 22. Thank you for that framing. It's really helpful. And yes, that's a perfect segue into our next question. So you helped to develop the Protect Our Freedoms framework in 2022. Uh, Sister District, we here adopted that framework alongside many of our incredible allies all across the ecosystem, and it was extremely successful. So uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about the Protect Our Freedoms framework, why it was successful, and maybe as a contrast, you know, kind of what was left on the cutting room floor? What, what didn't work? Yeah. Is this being recorded? Okay. Good to know for how I answer. Um, so Protect Our Freedoms evolved out of a partnership that myself, uh, my close friend and frequent colleague, Jennifer Fernandez and Kona, who co-founded donor collaborative called Way to Win and the folks at Future Forward kind of came together as a throuple. I got to teach the head of OSF the word throuple because OSF helped finance it. It's very, very exciting for him. The Society's Foundation. Yeah. Um, it's always good when I get to teach people words. Uh, some of you have no idea what I'm talking about, but that's not different to most of the time in my life. Um, so we did this project together where we started the midterms early, which is unusual for folks on our side and certainly for Democrats in particular, because normally what we do is we sort of blow all our advertising money at the very end. And there's a lot of reason for that. You know, people are paying more attention to the election, et cetera. But also what we find because of phenomenon we call persuasion windows, people become less and less and less persuadable the closer they get to the election. And so when something happens, sorry, this is a longer answer than you wanted. So when something happens like the Dobbs decision, which happened in June, that suddenly opens up what we call a persuasion window. And the exact same ad that we showed to people, let's say in April, we then show them in June, will have enormously larger impacts in June on the horse race. The same thing with an ad that was about universal single payer health care shown in February and then in March of 2020, if you will recall the onset of the pandemic. So there exist windows in times in which the populace are more persuadable. And people in Madison Avenue in marketing have known this for a very long time. There's a reason why around the holiday season, there are so many more ads about togetherness and family and food. People enter persuasion windows both reliably in cycles throughout the year that are related to holidays, it being cold, it being warm, but then also things like Dobbs happen and that can create a persuasion window. So the idea with Protect Our Freedoms, I did not forget the question, although that happens sometimes, was that we would start looking early in the summer at patterns by making and testing what ended up being 200 ads in total. So we made 200 30 second ads in the aggregate across us and we subjected them all to randomized control trials, looking for what would move folks on the horse race, what would move folks in terms of their intent to vote, what would move in particular um, communities of color, voters of color, what would increase Dem favorability and, and you know, increase Republican unfavorability. And we were looking for sort of that sweet spot of what we call the MOBA suasion ad, the ad that both mobilizes and persuades. Because again, if you can't get your base to say the thing, 
then the middle's not going to hear it. If you can't come up with an overarching idea like protect our freedoms or frankly, like make America great again, that's going to get repeated over and over and over, it's not going to get to a political people. They're not paying attention. So you need something that is going to be burned into people's brains. Partly because repetition is in and of itself persuasive. Messages that are more familiar to people are rated to be more credible, more likable. The simple act of something feeling familiar makes it seem more true to you. It's a little trick our brains play because it's easier for us to process. And that ease of processing is felt as something positive. So we tested all these ads for these various dependent variables. And what we found was patterns of kind of what worked across ads. And what we had seen, and I'd been pushing this for a very long time since I started doing work with different labor unions in 2016, that freedom was really this sort of integral concept that we couldn't let go of, that the right had claimed that we were scared of, even though it had been so pivotal to so many progressive victories from the civil rights movement, Freedom Riders, Freedom Summer, marriage equality, of course, the freedom to marry, um, FDRs for freedoms. It has always been in the lexicon of progressive victories. And so we wanted to have a freedom and more rightly a freedoms plural based message because we saw in our qualitative research that when we talked about freedoms plural people more um it was more evocative to them of progressive ideas that included things like freedom to retire in dignity freedom to you know earn enough to be with your family so economic ideas and of course freedom to decide whether and when you have kids that all important abortion connection freedom to learn which was a lot of work that we had done um just preceding this with the nea around how to push back on the anti-crt push right so we came up with this idea of protect our freedoms which is not a fully aspirational message and we knew that it wasn't right? There was no pretending that a protect message is fully like, you know, realize our freedoms, make the dream of freedom come true. Because where the electorate was at, or the, you know, we were hoping electorate, right? <laughs> People we wanted to turn out was not in a rah-rah things are awesome kind of place. And you can't, you know, you can't argue with people's feelings. That is not a useful thing to do. So we came up with this framework that was freedoms, but that was also an evocation of this idea that the opposition was there to take away your freedoms. And a lot of our messaging was about them taking away your freedoms. They've taken away your freedom to decide they're coming next for your freedom to retire. That was, you know, social security reference, et cetera. They are coming for your kids' freedom to learn and be all they can be. So this credible threat rendered even more credible because of Dobbs that outlined their ideology and provided us a thing that we could be. We were the people who were going to protect our freedoms. And most importantly, a way to talk to and about voters. So if you actually look at the ads that we ran, they weren't saying, and Democrats are going to protect your freedoms, or Democrats are coming in to protect your freedoms. It was this November, you vote to protect your freedoms. This November, your freedom is on the ballot you know, it's time to choose which side you're on. This November, choose which side you're on. So everything is directed at the voter as the protagonist of the story because you're trying to get the voter to do a thing. And also, because let's just call a spade a spade, messages that were like, and Democrats are coming in to save you. People were like, <laughs> that was just a massive bullshit alarm. And so even if that was, you know, a useful thing to do, which it wasn't because you're trying to get the voter to do a thing, it, nobody was buying that shit. Wow. Is that it? Nailed it. Okay. That's uh, fine. <laughs> that's very subtle. Yes. That's very good. <laughs> I haven't even said anything that terrible. <laughs> Thank you. That was such a helpful frame. And I agree, you know, even though it was 
somewhat protective, but still had this aspirational feeling. And I mean, I think everybody in here agrees, you know, freedoms are so central to why we feel so proud to live in this country and why we want to, uh, something that we can aspire to. So you mentioned Make and Make America Great Again. And I know know that one of your central teachings is also that you feed what you fight, meaning that you really should not, we should not be talking so much about the opposition, but I do want to spend a minute to ask you about the opposition, to ask you about the other side. And I'm curious, what's on your mind? What concerns you? Do you see any, <laughs> any clouds gathering on the horizon that we should be worried about? Um, does fascism worry me a little bit? Slightly concerned about fascism was hoping to have something else to do this year, but turns out we still got to do this shit. And not just here. Like I also, I worked on the Brazil election um, last, it just, it's a lot, there's a lot of it. It's like very popular. So, so what are um, they doing? What are they yeah. doing well? What are they doing well? Um, I mean, that's an interesting way into the question. Uh, if it helps me avoid saying what I'm concerned about, I mean, I can come back to that. So what are they doing? Well, you want to know like the truly sick thing. The truly sick thing is that a lot of their messaging is incredibly about belonging. They, what they are offering to people and specifically you know, in particular to straight white men is a sense of acceptance and belonging. A sense that the world will make sense here. You will be on top here. Things will be as they're supposed to be here. Women will know their place. Black people will know their place. Immigrants will know their place. Everyone's going to behave in the ways that you deem correct and appropriate. You're not going to be challenged. You're not going to have to pronounce a name that you're not sure how to say. You're not going to look like an idiot. You're going to be able to tell, you know, according to your own categorization, who a man is and who a woman is. And it's all going to be very clear. And your children are going to do what you want them to do. And all will be right with the world. And you'll, things will be as they were. It is a nostalgia for a past that obviously never existed, but it's a feeling of, stability and normalcy and a feeling that you're the things that are upsetting you the things that feel wrong which let's just face it are a fucking product of neoliberalism and the fault of center left parties in addition to right wing parties for allowing corporations to decimate unions for selling us down the fucking river for making it so that you know in america once upon a time at least if you were white you could afford on a single income to buy a house and go on you know a domestic vacation and all the stuff that you know right that you can't do anymore right? You can't get healthcare anymore. You can't be sure that your kids are going to be better off than you are. You can't be sure that you can pay for college. You can't be sure of anything really. And so people in that situation, they seek someone to blame. And what the other side has done, there's nothing new under the sun. It is the exact same tactic that all right-wing authoritarians have used throughout time, which is to pick some group a choose your own adventure of people who are to blame for why you feel shitty. When in fact, you need to stop pointing your finger at the brown guy and point your finger at the bad guy. Because I'm sorry, Juan didn't take your job. Juan's sitting outside of Home Depot looking for some fucking day labor. And it turns out doesn't set public policy, has never been asked to set public policy. In fact, Jeff Bezos took your job. That's what happened. And if you keep pointing your finger in the wrong direction, you're going to keep getting this wrong. So what do they get right? They provide a very weird, but very easily understood, beautiful tomorrow. It's Donna Reed. It's Leave it to Beaver. It's Father Knows Best. And it takes zero imaginative power for people who are drawn to that. To, to They've seen it on TV once upon a time. So it doesn't require imagination, whereas 
for us, we have to sell people a beautiful tomorrow that's never existed. We have to manufacture it out of pure suspension of disbelief and imagination, because in fact, we've never lived in a democracy, never. We do not now. We've never lived in a country in which there was justice. We've never lived in a country in which there was equality, in which people were actually genuinely respected for who they are. And, you know, people of color were not targeted and women were not belittled and people who are, you know, LGBTQ, all of this. We've never had that. Never. So when we're telling people, come join us, this is the thing we're going to have they have to just suspend disbelief and think that's possible when they haven't experienced it. So that's a tough, that's a tough thing for us to construct. Thank you for that answer. Sorry. Uh, no, it, I, what was the question? It was, let, let, let's just move on. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. No, that was, that was really, um, it was sobering, but really helpful. I am going to shift gears a little bit though. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit about one of my favorite pieces of content that came out of the midterms. And it was a, a video that you shared. That's the first time that I saw it. And it was a grandma very cheekily asking, do you go down all the way down? And it was it was a piece designed to turn um, to, to increase down ballot turnout. <laughs> and before I get censored out of here. So what happened in the ad? In the ad, she says, when I go down, that's right. I go all the way down. Yeah, you're right. You're down right. my ballot, that is. That's <laughs> I know because I wrote it. That was very good. That was good. So, um, so I just wanted to talk about this a little bit because we we love to see it, right? Like that made us so happy here at Sister District because um, our own research has confirmed something that we've kind of you know ambiently known that um, Republicans start at the top of the ticket and they vote all the way down. Democrats start at the ticket and they kind of they just roll off the ballot. Yes, they fade exactly. They stop. They stop voting. They don't complete their their ballot. So. You know, as just one example of this, because I think it's illustrative, we crunched the numbers and in Michigan in 2020, for example, there were 137,000 people who voted for Biden, but who did not vote for their Democratic state house candidate. So to make things even wilder, uh, there were only, it, we could have taken the state house back in Michigan. We wouldn't have had to wait till 2022. All we would have needed in 2020 was 8,600 votes. So uh, of those 137,000 people who voted for Biden, but who didn't vote for their Democratic state house candidate, sure, some of them split their tickets, some of them voted Republicans down ballot, but a lot of them just didn't finish their their ballot. And so, so you know, there's a lot of research to be done on this, but I'm I'm curious for your intuition on this. Like, what do you think is going on, and what advice do you have for everyone here um, as we look to persuade our friends and our families and recruit more people into this work? Yeah. Um, so let me say a couple of things. The first is that as much as we would like to believe otherwise, and I personally would like to believe otherwise, because, you know, I engage in an art of constructing and testing messages. The truth about voting is that it is largely a habituated behavior. It is not a behavior that is deeply influenced by messaging. Now, it can be at the margins and, you know, we win and lose in Wisconsin. We, you know, win and lose by less than a percentage point. So the bar, the margins matter. I mean, you just described margins mattering. So it still matters. But for the most part, people who vote vote and people who don't vote don't vote. The best analogy that I can use for it is flossing. Everybody knows they should floss. Everyone's been told to floss. Everybody knows how to floss. Everybody has had a dentist be like, the fuck is going on with your gums? You should be flossing. <laughs> floss is relatively cheap. It's not challenging to use, et cetera. And like, I'm not going to call you out here. Although, you know, there is, if there's any joy to be gleaned from an in-person event, it is calling you out. Most you know, like people don't floss, all of that. I personally do floss, which is why I feel very comfortable with this example. So my husband's here, you can ask him. Um, so this habituation extends to ballot completion. 
And so there are people who are not just habitual voters, but they are like super voters. I'm going to take a wild guess and say everyone in this room, even though most of you are probably Californians and our ballots are 700,000 pages long and include things that make absolutely no sense. None, none. I'm sorry, but like my qualifications to judge kidney dialysis procedure, it's like remarkably limited. I just don't know much about that. And I wish that the California state legislature would just like bring in experts. So, you know, there's also beef to be had with some just plain ridiculousness to have people without expertise and training voting on certain things, but I digress. Outside of California and Oregon and other very silly places where we vote on way too many things. Yes, I'm sorry. I know I'm like going no, against you, you're but we do. When, when we're trying to get people to vote down ballot, what we see is a few things. Number one, there is a perception among non-habitual voters, first-time voters, that they're going to do it wrong. So there is a big fear factor that they're going to make some sort of like giant mistake. <laughs> and, you know, there's going to be ramifications to it. And I, I, I suspect that that feels more true the farther down the ballot you get, because at least at the top of the ticket, you've sort of like heard people's names. And so you're kind of going off of some sort of muscle memory, like, I don't know, I've at least heard of, you know, Joe Biden. I've heard of him. Okay. Like, sounds good. So the first thing is actually just talking to people about how voting is something that all of us do. It's something familiar to every single adult in this country. It's so, just just making it less like there's a right way to do it and you're going to do it the wrong way. And, you know, so you have to balance kind of it's so important and it's so vital and it's so whatever with this feeling like it's, you know, you're going to get a Ph.D., that's like too much for people. So it's like, yes, this is incredibly important. And you know what? It's super simple. It's very straightforward. They've made it super easy. It's a bubble test. You don't even have to write things down. You just take your pen and fill in circle, like also making it more easy seeming. And then the other thing is that the fundamental challenge that we have is that we don't have a lot of straight partisanship, we have negative partisanship. So what we have is a phenomenon in which people aren't so much rah-rah Democrats. I mean, literally outside of like the people in Chuck Schumer family, I don't think most people like Democrats, right? Um, and I say that as a Democrat. Uh, we have negative partisanship. It's not so much I'm team blue, it's I cannot stand team red. And that is true of the other side too. Like negative part partisanship is a massive factor in people's political identity. They have a little bit more partisanship, like positive partisanship than we do. So what that suggests is that when we're getting, we're trying to get ballot completion, we're trying to get people to go all the way down um, and vote for their state representatives, we either attempt to activate some kind of partisanship, not by saying Democrats will, but by rather saying this whole slate of people are going to protect your freedoms. You know, it's not just Gretchen Whitmer and it's not just Jocelyn Benson in Michigan, the example you offered, so I'm extending it, but it's also, and I don't know the names of the people that were running for the state, so like, I can't, I'm not that good. But, you know, all of these people, to have an overarching message and to stick everyone into it, more than just, these are all the Democrats running. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so we have a few minutes left and would love to take audience questions. I have more, but I know that you all have some. Lisa. How do you deal with people who just say, I am so tired of hearing all about this? Yeah. Um, it, I mean, obviously depends on the context, but just on the basis of that question, what I would say is, you know, I totally hear you. It is a lot to keep at this. It is a lot to live in a country in which we're essentially never out of an election because, you know, it's already 2024 
season is going to start any minute now. And so I sort of think about the reasons, this is me still talking to that person. I think about the reasons why that is. Why is it that we have so much going on in our politics? And it seems to me, when I think about it, that most of us, whatever we look like, wherever we come from, whatever our background, we kind of want similar things. Care for our families, be able to hang out with them once in a while or avoid them once in a while set our kids off, you know, leave things better for those to come, breathe some clean air, have, you know, a nice place to hang out once in a while. And when I think about what's getting in the way of that, what I can see over and over again is that we have a handful of corporations that are profiting off of this pandemic. And they always have. And they are paying certain politicians, MAGA Republicans, to do their bidding. And if they get us to stop paying attention, if they get us to be sick of it, and I get it, I get why you're sick of it, and they get us to tune out, then they can just take over. When we stop engaging and paying attention, that is when we let the already powerful decide that they can take away all of our freedoms and we're not going to say anything about it. So basically what I do is I narrate to people that creating cynicism in us is a strategy. And in fact, I mean, you know, the ultimate aim of guerrilla warfare, which means the assault of a minority faction on a majority population is to erode the enemy's will to resist. The per their purpose is to get us to stop even trying. And so sometimes I just tell people that, yeah, I get it. You're sick of it. I'm sick of it too. I just... And I know that that's what they want. They want us to be sick of it. Uh, Jeff, then Catherine. Uh, I think. Does that sound good? Yeah. So yeah, and so we're we're fighting that, and it's hard and. I was wondering if you have any gurus on the right of center side, the never Trumpers, I don't know, I'm thinking like people like Sarah Longwell and, and the Lincoln Project. It seems like they have a lot of money and their ads don't really square with the approach that you recommend. Is there a way to kind of get that resource for a little while to kind of better align? <laughs> <laughs> what do you really think? <laughs> I want to separate Sarah, who I know and respect, from Lincoln Project. Um, there are variations of Never Trumpers. She is among them much better than some of the others. Um, so my the following remarks do not apply to her. The last time a Never Trumper won a national election, when was it? 2004 which is in politics, the Mesozoic era. In terms of what has changed, how campaigning has changed, social media, discourse, what's going on. The last time they won a national election was in 2004. The advice that they keep peddling out, they can't get their own fucking party to take. They cannot get Republicans to take their advice. So when you are a person who has, by definition, never turned out a Democratic base voter, never, never persuaded a voter towards a set of Democratic policy preferences, and you want to tell me you're an expert in doing either of those two things, plus you haven't won an election in a million years, plus you can't get your own party to follow your advice, I'm sorry, but bullshit, bullshit, bullshit on that. And, you know, you've really taught, like, the number of times that I have to go on, like, fucking NPR with a never, you know, with a Republican where we get to talk about what Democrats need to do better, what I, I'm like, when do I get to be on the segment about what Republicans need to do better? When do you have a Democrat on to talk about why, why, why are we letting the jocks tell us how to play instruments in band? Their task is not our task. 
I understand that we grew up revering them and we're very, very sad that we had to go to band camp and people didn't think we were cool, but band camp is now cool. I understand this is like a strained analogy and maybe some of you are not grabbing onto it, <laughs> but first of all, they're just like, where is their credibility coming from? They've never won a democratic election, never. Definitionally, never. And then as far as the Lincoln Project ads, we tested them. Here is who they work on. Yeah. <laughs> Here is how they work. Hey, let me give you money. Let me give you money. They do not engage disaffected voters because they are the length of a Ken Burns documentary and 80% of people stop watching political ads within the first second. Their ads are two minutes long. Do you have any idea how absurd it is to think that an apolitical person is going to watch that shit? They aren't. I promise you the video completion rates, they only work on Twitter among already politically engaged never Trumpers, i.e. you people, because you are also never Trumpers. And then as far as persuasion, they actually backlash because they are so heavy handed that if you're talking to somebody who voted for Trump in 2016 and you're trying to get them to change their minds in 2020, or you're trying to get them to vote Democratic in 22, I don't know about you, but I've personally never had the experience of saying to someone, I think you're a fucking idiot and you made the following two minutes worth of mistakes. So will you change your mind, please? I've never had that work. So and this is not directed at you. This is just me using your question to like be on my soapbox. Just like, it's very upsetting that we are so easily taken in by what feels like hard hitting and they, you know, they don't pull any punches. That does not persuade. It makes people defensive because when it is two minutes of just like, this is horrible and, you know, Trump is terrible, Trump is terrible, Trump is terrible. How is a person supposed to have the permission architecture to say, I screwed up in 2016 and I'm going to make a change in 2020? And that is what we saw. And in point of fact, Trump had gains with the target audiences of the Lincoln Project. It did backlash, not just in RCT, but in the world. So is there a way to get more alignment? I don't know. I don't feel like there's any incentive out of those camps. And again, I don't consider Sarah in this category. Sarah genuinely wants better for America, but it's a grift. They made millions of dollars, which they double dealt by, you know, being their own production company. It just, ugh. Ugh. okay yeah this is the very i don't know how we top that but this, this is the last question when you said that what republicans are doing um, first thing you said was they're providing a sense of belonging that really resonated i think um we're trying to do a couple of things um this uh mass media effort of getting, you know, being part of a, of a social media effort to really fight back against the, the big noise machine of the extreme right, right? Smaller scale, we're talking about what we do when we get a brand new person joining our team. What do we say to them? I think both of those things are about maybe how we make them feel like they're gonna belong with us. Um, do you have any thoughts on what we say or what we put into a, a meme that would convey that? Um, I mean, to reduce it down to a meme, it's hard. I would have to know more particulars about, you know, what more precisely you're trying to get done. But what I can say more broadly is this, um, oftentimes our messaging, especially about issues where we're talking about a population that is challenged in some way is an attempt to evoke sympathy. It is some sort of, you need to feel sorry for those people. Those people could be people experiencing homelessness or people who are formerly incarcerated or people who are struggling with some sort of addiction or people who are trans or gender non-conforming, gender non-binary, or people who are seeking refuge or asylum or you know whatever the category is. 
And so what we often do is we show that those people's pain. And it's just a fundamental belief of mine that we shouldn't make people perform their pain for us as a condition of accepting their humanity. And so instead of trying to engineer sympathy, we are much better off trying to get at empathy. So let me give you a concrete idea, which comes back to belonging. I didn't forget what you said. So in this project that my colleague Jillian led up that our firm did, it was around pushing back on this, you know, trans panic, this anti-trans movement that is happening sort of in concert and in parallel with the anti-CRT and the book bans and, you know, all the race baiting. And in focus groups, what we did was we talked to people across the spectrum about a time when they felt like they were forced into a box where they had to perform behavior or act in a way that they didn't feel comfortable with. And from a lot of Black respondents, we heard a set of stories about having to wear their hair in some prescribed way and how off-putting and terrible that was in the schoolyard or in the workplace or both and. And even from, you know, sort of older cis straight white men, we would hear, you know, when I grew up, I remember being told boys don't cry and you're a pansy and you're a sissy and so on. And I hated that. And that was really hard for me. And when you could talk to people about how we're all, we're all forced into boxes in some way or another, and obviously some to a much greater extent than another, because, you know, there are more variations away from what our society and culture deem okay or normal or acceptable mainstream. But to a certain degree, we're all forced to perform at certain moments and we don't like it. When you talk to people about that, you can create a sense of belonging that helps them understand the experience of someone that is completely different to them and be willing to acknowledge that they should have rights and freedoms and that they should also be able to be their authentic self. And that's the kind of a belonging where it's not a right-wing conform belonging. Like they create belonging, but the belonging is with a lot of conditions. The belonging is as long as you look away, act away, talk away, behave away. And that's the belonging. You can belong as long as you're in the box. What we're saying is that we're going to create a belonging that's made out of freedom, that's made out of true, authentic freedom. Because for the most part, what most people want is just to be a little bit more fabulous, to have a life that is a little bit more joyous and a little bit more connected and a little bit more authentic and with less fear that people will judge them or ostracize them or laugh at, you know, that they can like wear a pink tutu, even though they're supposed to be a professional on a stage and that that will still be fine. And so if we can give that to people, if we can say to people, belonging here means you get to be who you are. And so do I, and so does everybody else then that is attractive. And that is what the other side cannot stand. They cannot stand our joy. They cannot stand our boldness. They cannot stand our color choices. They cannot stand our, you know, they cannot stand our performances and our art and our music and our love for each other. That is what they cannot stand because that is expansive. It is boundless, and that scares the shit out of them because they need rigidity, they need boundaries, they need everything to be known and encapsulated. And so if we can actually be that way, if we can actually just be free and open with each other and accepting of each other, then that's a kind of positive belonging that we can offer. My friends, I have nothing left to add. Please, let's give it up for a notch in Osorio. <laughs>